Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Today, we are doing C++ code profiling. Um, this will not be tested in any way, shape, or form during the term. There's no exam, and this isn't a necessary part of the project or any of the assignments. But hopefully, all of you as good computer science students want your code to run efficiently and quickly, right? And part of that process is actually knowing um, how to use a profiler. So today, I'm going to go over uh, some demos of profilers, explain what they are, how you can use them, and then we'll be writing an instrumenting profiler uh, from scratch and using it in one of the course assignments, um, which I haven't tested before, so hopefully the live coding portion of that goes well. So let's jump right into the uh, slideshow and get started. Okie doke. So today we're going to be talking about C++ visual profiling and singleton classes, because singleton classes are going to be used for this purpose, um, in our code base at least. So, first of all, what is a singleton class? So a singleton is a programming pattern. It's typically implemented with object-oriented programming, and if you create a singleton pattern on a class, we say that that class is a singleton class. And what a singleton class is, is that it ensures that only one instance of that class can ever be created. And its typical use case is when we want to have some sort of global functionality and we don't want to use a global variable, right? Because global variables are bad, they have global access, we don't necessarily want that. And so we will have um, a singleton implement some global functionality for us. And some typical use cases for this global functionality could be like a logger, for example. Um, or a blackboard system where we hold some data that um, the whole program needs to use. Um, and its implementation, the, it's, the pattern for implementation is kind of the same for most programming languages, but the specific syntax is obviously going to depend on the language. So we are doing C++ in this course, and C++ makes implementing a singleton class really, really easily. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make use of a static variable and a static function to ensure that only one instance of a class can be created. And we'll also make sure that the constructor of the class is private so that no other uh, code can accidentally instantiate one. Okay, so here's an example of a singleton class. So here we've got a class declared just as anything else. We're going to have some private stuff and we're going to have some public stuff in that singleton. First of all, the singleton class is going to have a private constructor. And what that means is that only the singleton class itself can construct itself. Okay, now that might seem a little bit confusing. How do we actually get an instance of a singleton class to use? So the public facing thing that we can use to get the instance of the singleton class is this function called instance. And so this is a static function and what, that, what a static function means, at least in C++, and I believe in Java as well, is that this function does not operate on an instance of the, of the class. It's a function, sort of like a global function on the class that does not pertain to any specific instance of that class. So for example, in a static function, you won't be using any member variables of a specific instance of a singleton class. So what we have here is this function instance, it's declared static, and it returns a reference to a singleton object, okay? So what's going to happen inside this function is we declare a static singleton instance, and what happens when you declare a static variable is that this code is only ever run once, all right? So the first time we call the instance, function, this line seven is run, and then we return that instance as the return value for this function. But every subsequent, subsequent time that we call this function, this static singleton instance, this line seven is never run again, okay? So if you have a static instantiation um, of a variable inside a function, it's only ever performed the first time you call that function. So every other time we call this function, what's going to happen is it's just going to return the reference to that instance that we set up the first time that we called that function. 
And then we could have other functions on the singleton class, uh, for example, do thing. And since this is not a static function, then it will operate on an instance of that variable, okay? So the outside usage that we would have on a singleton class, at least with this programming pattern, is that we would say, in order to get access to that singleton instance, we would say singleton colon colon instance. And then that would be the reference, okay? So here we can consider this to be like brackets around this. So this will be our instance, right? That will return us this variable that we created right there. And then since we now have access to the instance, then we can do things with that instance. So for example, dot do thing, right? So one of the canonical examples um, for a singleton class is a logger class, okay? Um, this is incorrect up here. This will be... Um, logger.hpp. I don't know why that said that. All right. So this is going to be how we would implement a sort of logger class in C++. And by a logger class, what I mean is, let's say you just have a single file, which is like log.txt. And anytime you want to log th something in your program, you'll call logger.log with some string. And we were going to ensure that only one instance of that logger class ever exists so that it will be the only thing that has access to that file and we know that we're outputting things sequentially to that file and everything will work properly. So this logger class is going to have a standard output file stream, right? So this is gonna be a member variable. We're just gonna call it file out or f out. And we're going to instantiate that by opening an output file stream on my log.txt file, for example. Then, I'm going to have my logger class, since it's going to be a singleton and I don't want anyone outside of here to be able to instantiate it, my, uh, lo my constructor is going to be private for the logger class. Then, just like my example file, we have the exact same code for the instance function, which is actually going to give me the reference to the instance for this class. So static logger instance return instance. And then we'll have a function inside the logger class that does the actual logging, right? So I can have a function here, which is called log, and it's going to take in a, a const reference to a string, and it's just going to uh, pipe that into the string, right? So these are all using um, streams, and so we take our string, we send it to that stream, and it will send it to the file. So it'll, it'll print that to the file. So whenever we want to log something inside our program, all we would have to do is include logger.hpp and then um, we would say logger colon colon instance dot log and whatever string we wanted. And then we know that that would go to the, you know, that would append that to the last line in that file. So that's how it works. That's how simple it is. And this is a fully working logging system that you could use in your program um, if you wanted to. Now, this is a little bit verbose right? Um, sometimes you don't want to have to call logger colon colon instance dot log. You might just want to say logger log or something. So what you could do is you can create a syntax to remove that instance call if you want. Now this is just for convenience. This is, it actually gets kind of tedious if you have many public functions, but if you only have one public function on your singleton class, which is like log, for example, maybe you don't want to have to call this huge like instance dot every time you use it. So here's what you could do. You could have a function, um, a private function called like log implementation, right? This is the function that actually does the logging itself, right? So this is the same as our previous log function. That's private. So we can't directly access that. And you can't directly access the instance function either. So you can no longer get access to the instance in order to do the logging. However, since we only ever want to do like, hey, log something with this class, and we want to hide all of those implementation details from the user, then what we could have is a static function, which is called log, that takes in a string. And then inside that log function, we called instance, dot log implementation with the string. So what this does is the only public facing function is this static function. 
and we pass in a string, it gets access to the instance, right? Because it can, because it's part of the class, so we can it can reference this private function. And then it calls that other private function, which actually does the logging for this, okay? And then outside usage, you would just see logger, colon, colon, log, hello there. So if we have a, a, a singleton class, which has very basic functionality like a logger, maybe we would want to do something like this. But for the most part, we would just keep this functionality. So we have an instance function that's public that gives us access to the instance, and then we have some public functions that we can call based on that. Okay. Um, give me a sec. If you look at game development articles, uh, especially game AI development articles, you'll often see references to this data structure known as a blackboard, okay? Um, and a blackboard is like a global data storage or management system. Um, and a blackboard could be implemented as a singleton. So what a blackboard does is it essentially keeps everything... So you might need access to a bunch of global data for some reason, right? So for example, maybe a bunch of different systems in your game need to know what level the player is or what world the player is on, or how many hit points the player has, or, or something like that. So this data that might need to be accessed by a bunch of different systems. And so rather than polluting the global namespace with a bunch of this data, you could have a Blackboard singleton with functions to be able to get access to that data. Okay, and this, this code ends up being cleaner and safer than just using global variables everywhere. So that's just another uh, example of a singleton that you might end up using. Okay, so that's what a singleton class is. And a bit later in this, um, I was about to say episode, but in this lecture, you'll see why we, um, why we talked about singletons. All right, so profiling code. The whole point of that uh, intro singleton was to enable us to be able to write a profiler later in this. So what is profiling code? Profiling code involves timing specific functionality in order to see how long different functions or methods take to run, okay? So basically, profiling your code means how long do these functions take to run? And we're gonna compare that to other functions and we're going to see what parts of our code might be really efficient or really inefficient and how we can use that to speed up um, the rest of our program, okay? so. Visual Studio has profiling tools built in that can help profile your code. And we're going to look at a couple of those in a couple of minutes. I'm actually going to start up Visual Studio and uh, we'll see that. Just give me one second. Uh, all right. So before we jump into that, though, I'm going to explain a few different types of profilers and how they might be used. Um, oops, well, there you go. So there are several different types of code profilers and it's necessary to know those types of profilers in order to be able to choose which type of profiler you want to do for a specific job, okay? So the first type of profiler is called an event-based profiler. An event-based profiler, um, it would come with a specific language or a specific API for a language that has built-in events which trigger profiler data collection. So for example, the API um, for your event-based profiler might provide hooks to events like function calls, memory allocation, class construction, construction entering or leaving threads. So important events that may happen in your code. However, event-based profilers rely on specific functionality that's implemented either by the language or by the API. So I'm sure there are really great event-based profilers out there, but in my opinion, event-based profilers have the lowest resolution of the three main profiler types that I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm not super familiar with event-based profilers, so we won't be using um, an event-based profiler today. And also there aren't many, if any of them, that exist and do a good job in, in C++. So event-based profilers look like this. So this is JVMPI, and JVMPI is an event-based pro profiler for Java, okay? 
So essentially, this JVMPI system sits between this profiler front end and the Java virtual machine. And when certain events are fired by the JVM, the profiler agent detects those and then sends, you know, whatever data has to be sent out to the profiler. And then you can either analyze that yourself or write it to a file to analyze later. But essentially, it's an event-based system. So you set up some events that you want to trigger profiling data, and then later on you can analyze that data. But like I said, I am not super familiar with these because they only exist for, there's not a lot of them, and they only exist for specific languages. Next is statistical profilers. Statistical profilers are one of the more common ways to profile code, and they collect profiling data via sampling. So what happens is your program is running and then the, the profiler is running in parallel to your program. And the profiler probes your program at regular intervals using operating system interrupts. And essentially it asks, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? Right? Every few nanoseconds or whatever the, you know, you can change the resolution on, on some sample based profilers. So what it does is it, it records what you're doing at regular intervals. And so it looks at the call stack and says, oh, you're in the logger function. Oh, you're in the physics function. Oh, you're in the rendering function. Oh, you're in the physics function. Oh, you're in the physics function, right? So statistics about samples are then displayed to the user after the program is run for interpretation. So for example, um, you could run your statistical profiler and maybe it's it's taking samples every 10 microseconds or something, right? And so at the end, you see 30% of the samples collected showed that when you probed, it said, I'm in the render function. So what that means is that probably 30% of your program's running time is in the rendering function, right? However, it's not exact. So the probing could get unlucky, right, statistically, but statistically, it's usually pretty good, right? And the good thing about statistical profilers is that there's very little overhead in the statistical profiler because you've got another program running in parallel, that's the profiler, and it's probing your program only ever so often to collect little samples about what you're doing, right? It's kind of like your boss at work poking your head in, poking their head in every few minutes to see what you're doing. And if every single time they poke your head in, their head in to, to, to watch you, you're playing, I don't know, you're playing some, something on your phone, then they probably think that you spend too much time on your phone. And so this is what statistical profilers do. And here's what it looks like. So your program runs, right, uh, from left to right here. And every so often, the, the, the profiler is going to probe your call stack and record that data because that data is available to the operating system. So the first time it probes it, Maybe it's doing this like handle request from a server. The second time might be in some sort of customer um, class uh, uh, constructor. The third time, maybe it's looking up a customer in a database. The fourth time it's doing some order thing. And so what's happening is, is at these regular intervals, right? It's saying, what are you doing? 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 That is a sampling or statistical profiler. And I'll show you uh, Visual Studio has a, has a statistical profiler and I'll show you that in a couple of seconds when I do a demo. The next type is called an instrumentation profiler. So, so far we've seen event-based, statistical, and finally instrumentation. So in an instrumentation-based profiler, instructions are added to your program to collect data and output the desired type of profiling data. And this can be done uh, either manually, by the language, by the compiler, etc. And so, and I'll show an example of this in a bit, but the good thing about this is that the profiling data will be fairly exact because it's not sampling usage, it's actually inserting code that says, time this function for me. And when the function finishes, it will say, stop timing that function, right? However, there's sort of a Schrodinger's cat situation going on here where you're trying to probe or you're trying to figure out how fast your program runs by inserting more code into your program. 
And so the actual profiling process of an instrumentation-based profiler, the introduction of that instrumentation code can change the runtime of the program. Pretty minorly, right? But it can change it. So just keep that in mind. So that the profiling data will be exact, as exact as you want it. However, it may take some time to actually gather that data. And so, for example, starting and stopping the timer takes time. Collecting the data in a data structure takes time. File output, they all take some tangible amount of time. And if, you, if you're not doing this in a threaded way, and, and turns out most instrumentation is not done multi-threaded, right? It's just in, it's, it's running alongside your program. Um, it can add some running time to your program. And it allows fine control over we want to profile. So later in this lecture, we're going to be implementing a manual instrumentation timer. Um, someone says, is this what happens when you compile with debug options on? It acts like an instrumentation profiler. Not necessarily, okay? So when you run a program with debug mode on, that the reason debug mode is so much slower is because it exposes a bunch of internal symbols, um, debugging symbols for the debugger to keep track of. So debugging and profiling are completely separate things. However, the profiler in Visual Studio, as we're about to see, we have a demo now, um, is actually, um, it's under the debug menu, okay? But before that, um, I actually wanna change around the order of these slides. So an instrumentation-based profiler will look something like this, okay? So you're gonna have some function in your program that you wanna do profiling for, and you will actually insert code that says like, profile this function for me, right? So it's actually running inside your program. Um, you might be able to profile an entire function. Maybe you want to profile uh, a scoped block of code. So for example, I want to profile just this loop iteration versus the entire function, right? So the good thing about instrumentation is that it will let you do something like, um, only profile my physics function and only profile my rendering function. Turn either one on or off at any time because you're literally inserting this into it. But again, the downside is A, there's a little bit more code in your program, right? So it makes it a little bit messier. And B, um, it may make it run a little bit slower. However, this is a sort of manual instrumentation profiler. And there are also automatic implementation profilers. And you'll see with Visual Studio, it comes with an automatic one as well. So with the automatic instrumentation profiler, when you say instrument my code, the, pro the compiler will actually insert these things and you won't ever see it being done, okay? So let's go now uh, to a quick demo where I can show this being done. All right, so let's go back to the main screen. Um, so this is assignment three. So let me just run it uh, really quickly. This is my solution code to assignment three. So as you can see here, um, we're just running, you know, basic assignment three, um, and I'm jumping around and I'm doing some stuff. So, you know, this has got a bunch of different functions in it. So I want to say, okay, let's see what's happening under the hood for this code. So in Visual Studio, uh, the, the font may be a little bit small. I apologize for that. Under the debug menu, you can come down and say uh, performance profiler. So let's look at performance profiler. Here, we get a number of options with the performance profiler. Um, so it says, first of all, you select the startup project. And the startup project over here is the SFML game project that you're familiar with. It's the only project in here. So what we're going to do is first, we're going to use the CPU, sample, uh, CPU usage um, profiler. And this is a sample-based profiler. So what's going to happen is we're going to click this, and then we're going to click Start and it will run our program. And now as we're running the program, you know, we're jumping around, we're doing some stuff. Maybe we're, we're shooting some things here. We're gonna look here. We're gonna jump up into these things. We're gonna do some stuff. And the, in the background, the operating system is asking, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing, right? So now uh, let's say, okay, we're done with that gameplay session. Let's stop it. So now it's collecting the data. That can take a long time if you've, if you've had a long profiling session, that data can be quite, um, quite intense. So 
In here, what we've just done is we've created a number of samples. And you can see here um, sort of a breakdown of the samples that we've done. So it looks like a majority of the samples, if I can, can I increase this easily? No, I can't increase this font easily. A majority of the samples that were taken for, were from external code. Now it turns out that assignment three isn't necessarily the best thing to profile using sampling because a lot, this game is running at 60 frames per second. And as we saw a few lectures ago in main loops, the vast majority of the computations being done or the vast majority of the time for assignment three is actually SFML waiting to display the next frame. And so when you see here external code, that's a lot of the stuff being done um, by SFML. But let's just drill down a little bit into some of these functions. The cool thing about sample-based profiling is that it'll give me... Okay, so not only are there different types of profilers, but there are different views into your profiling results as well. So here, for example, we have a view into our um, profiling results, and this is the function-based view. So up here, there's a number of different views. There's functions, modules, calls, tree, call trees, etc. This is just a list of all the functions, all right? And what this does is there are two type of statistics for each of our function. The first one is the total CPU percentage, and that means it's the total CPU percentage that was spent in this function or any of the functions that were called by this function, okay? The second type is self CPU percentage, and this is the percentage of time that was spent only within this function and not hierarchically what was being called by this function. So for example, if we want to see which functions were sampled the most in our program, and we didn't do a lot of samples here, um, we would see that, okay, first is external code. External code is unfortunate because the we don't have the source code for the SFML stuff that was running, but just understand that the majority of the time was actually spent in the, the window display update where we're waiting, you know, 15 milliseconds per frame um, to display the next frame of data. All right, so uh, the next function that took the most amount of time was our collision system. And so that's cool. We can now see that the collision system was actually the biggest time waster in our actual code. And down here, we can sort of see these hot spots in the collision code because the sampling based instrumentation knows the exact line of code that was running whenever we called something. Right? So you can see here that like 29 times we called physics or 29 times our sampling hit physics get overlap. 24 times it's it called uh, get previous overlap, right? And you can see here that not a lot of this other stuff was actually sampled. Oh, up here we have another get overlap, right? And up here this loop um, was uh, being, th this loop was sampled a few times or this for loop header. So what we see, what we can glean from this is that this is sort of the hot part of our code. Of the, of the 1% of our code that was actually sampled, um, this is taking up like a majority of it. So about half of the running time of our program was spent in our physics function, which is, you know, something that we can go see. And oh, over here in physics get overlap, um, it looks like here, this line of code where we do this mathematics, that was called a lot. And interestingly enough, we can also see that the mo a lot of the time in the get overlap function wasn't actually in the mathematics, but in the destructors of the things that were set up to actually compute the mathematics. So we can look and, and really drill down into the code here and see like what was, what was going on. All right, so that's sampling based. Obviously, like when we go into our collision function, right? One second, I wanna get back to that collision function. Um, there are lines of code here that were not sampled, right? Now these lines of code are very quick. This is just getting a reference. This is just getting a reference. This is just doing um, like creating an animation. So you can see that it was never sampled. So it's not exact, 
right? It's just picking some times to do some sampling and it's not exact. It's not telling us exactly how long everything takes to run. So if we want exact numbers, what we can do is let's first close this down and then we're gonna to go to debug and we're gonna put a performance profiler and instead of the CPU usage sampling based, we're going to get instrumentation based profiling. So this says instrument your application to ex investigate exact call counts and call times. So now we're gonna do the same thing. Um, it may have to recompile, but we're gonna play the game. We're gonna jump around. Uh, we're gonna kill some stuff here. Da, da, da. We're gonna shoot some bullets. Let's shoot a bunch of bullets. Shooting a bunch of bullets. And uh, maybe I will jump over here and let me destroy some of these bricks and then shoot some bullets into there. All right, so that's good enough. Now let's see what Visual Studio outputs for this. Alrighty, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click this and we're going to go to the call tree view. The call tree view lets us see exactly where the time was spent. Um, oh crap, uh, inclusive time, yes. So inclusive time, remember elapsed inclusive time means the amount of time that was spent in this function and all of its functions that were called. So we can see here, so there's a lot of stuff like obviously all of our functionality was done inside sfmlgame.exe, right? So everything happened within the executable. Everything happened within this default Microsoft startup, and then there was some security things that happened, but we're really looking down here for the main function. Right? So the main function in our program, 100% of things happened in the main function, and there was exactly one call to the main function within our program. So if we look down here and we drill down a bit more, uh, we can see, okay, here's our game engine's update function. So if you're familiar with assignment three, game engine update is basically where everything happens, right? So 97% of the code happened in there. So let's drill a bit down further into uh, game engine update. All right, so we can see that of all of those times, then the scene update function uh, took none of that time, essentially. 1.3% of the time was in the user input. 1.5% um, of the time was in scene plays update function. And, uh, oh look, most of the time was spent inside um, the window of SFML, right? So the render function for SFML took by far the most amount of time. In fact, 91% of the running time of our function. But if we want to like look at our code, let's see here. So inside scene play update, we have the entity manager update that was called 1500 times. We have um, collision that was called a lot of times. And within collision, we can see that, okay, um, our physics get overlap function was called 229,000 times. And, or sorry, get overlap was called 358,000 times and get overlap was called 229,000 times. And so you can really see now the exact data on how many times each function was called and the amount of times that that was called. We can even say, oh, look, we were looking up things in a map um, and that took like 2% of our running time or 0.2% of our running time. And inside our movement function, um, I can tell here that, you know, when I spawned a bunch of bullets, I can see that in that playthrough, I spawned 62 bullets, right? And of that many times, um, I had to like add components 62 times and do all this other kind of stuff. So the instrumentation-based timing is more exact. It tells you the exact counts of every function in your program. It tells you how much time they were taking. Now, unfortunately, in this case, right, a lot of our time was being taken up by the SFML uh, render functionality, which is in the DLL, so we can't see the code of that. So that instrumentation timer is what we are actually going to build from scratch, and we are going to do something really cool. Um, so if I go into here, 
Let's see here. Is there any visualization? There's not really any good visualization inside Visual Studio for this. It's just like, okay, now I can see all the different functions and stuff. So which function was called the most in our program? Physics get overlap, for example, right? So how does that actually work? How does the compiler do that? How could we do that ourselves if we wanted to? And more importantly, how can we ingest that data in a better visual way rather than relying on Visual Studio's um, sort of archaic, archaic text-based way of looking at it? All right, let's go back to the slides and we'll figure it out. So that was our, our, um, our demo. Let's build our own instrumentation-based timer. And I, I really love this. This is like the first time I saw this, I was blown away. So hopefully um, you are all um, similarly blown away by, by this particular topic. So we want to write first, in order to do instrumentation, we have to have a timer, right? We just need a timer. We need to be able to say when something started and when something finished and then be able to subtract those two things. So basic logic for timing code would be record the starting time somewhere, run some code, record the finish time somewhere, and then the amount of time that elapsed, so the, the time it took our code to run, is the finish time minus the starting time. And in C++, there's this package in the STL called standard chrono. And standard chrono gives us some timing tools. So we can use standard chrono high resolution clock now. And I know it's a bit verbose, <laughs> but that will give us the current time in like microseconds to within, I don't know, 100 microseconds or something like that. So it's pretty quick. It's pretty, pretty low resolution or I guess high resolution. Yeah. And we can use this in order to calculate the time elapsed. So if we call now and record that as the start and then we do something else and then we call now again and record that as the end and subtract those two, that'll give us the time elapsed. So let's write a class, right? Object-oriented programming is great. We can write a class that does all that for us. So having to manually record starting and ending times all over our code would be absolutely atrocious. Just imagine having like in every function, standard chrono, high resolution clock, now all that kind of nonsense, right? You don't want to have to do that. So we're going to write our own class. And here is the functionality of our class. We're going to start store the start time via some start function on our class. We're going to be able to query how much time has passed via an elapsed function. We want to be able to start or stop the timer at will, and we want to abstract away this very verbose standard chrono syntax. So here is what we're going to do for our timer. So um, this is our timer.hpp, so it's all just gonna be in this header file. And of course we have to include chrono from the standard template library. So here's our timer class. We're gonna have some private stuff. We're gonna have some public stuff. We are going to record the start time and the end time. And here we're using a long, long, and that's essentially the longest integer based type that can be stored in C++, right? So it might be 64 bits, it might be 128 bits, I can't remember. I think it's it's probably uh, system specific. So it's, it's very long, right? Long, long, uh, it's just hilarious. It's longer than an integer. Then, we are going to have um, this time point and standard chrono time point. This time point is going to be used as the thing which starts and stops our timer, okay? So um, we're going to have a public constructor and the constructor is going to call the start function, okay? So whenever we construct a timer, it is going to start the timer for us. And the good thing is, we're going to have this start function so that if I did want to construct a timer somewhere and then start it later, then I can do that, right? But by default, it's also going to call it on startup. So the start function is going to set this time, time point, okay? So it's not stored just as an integer. There are some other things going on here. So we record that um, as standard chrono high resolution clock now gives us this time point that we record as the start of the timer. Then we're going to uh, have this elapsed functionality. So whenever we call the function elapsed, it's going to tell us how much time has passed since we called the start function, right? That's pretty obvious. 
So inside here, um, now this syntax is going to get even more crazy. So I'm going to be using namespace standard chrono inside this function just so stuff fits on these slides. All right. Here's what's going to happen. So this is the starting time point up here. It recorded when we started. Now we're going to use an ending time point. So end time point. And we're going to call standard chronos high resolution clock now. Right. So that is going to record the ending time point. And then starting and ending. Um, here we have start, here we have end, and in order to turn these standard chrono time points into actual integers, we have to tell it what unit of time we want to convert this to. So we want it in microseconds, so we're going to time point cast into microseconds the starting time point, and we will this is the time since the epoch, or time since 1970, essentially, how, how C++ likes to count things, dot count. So this will count the number of microseconds since January 1st, 1970, and store it in start. And then the ending time point will do the same thing, and then we return m end minus m start, right? So we return the number of microseconds that have passed since we called the starting functionality. And this is a basic timer class, and we can use this wherever we want, okay? All right, so here's some example usage of that timer class that we just wrote. Let's say I want to time something in my main function. Then I'm gonna set up this timer. I'll say timer t. Uh, maybe I have to do some things like I have to read in some files or I have to do some other things, right? This timer is ticking, but I don't want to like I don't want to make the timer start from where I initialized it. I want to make the timer timer start from here, right? So I'll say t dot start. So I've started the timer now, and on the very next line, I want here's the thing I actually want to time. So I'm gonna call some function that takes some amount of time. Then I'm going to record elapsed is equal to t dot elapsed, and then I print out the elapsed time is this elapsed in microse microseconds or u seconds. And that's how you use it, okay? Um, someone said, I noticed the clocks are still running as the elapsed time is calculated, but that's intentional because the code, its timing would still be running as the elapsed time is calculated. So don't think of timers as running, okay? There's no active portion to a timer like this. Timers are not running. Like you don't have a, you don't, you didn't start a stopwatch that's displaying one second, two second, three second, four second. What you did was you said, okay, it started at 8.04 PM and two seconds. And you just write that down. And then that's it. You just remember that. And then when you want to see how much time is elapsed, you say, oh, it's 8.06 PM now. So I subtract 806 from 802 or whatever I said before. So four minutes of time has passed. So there's nothing ticking. There's nothing happening. You just record the starting time and later on you record the ending time. Okay. All right. I hope that answered your question. So this is how you would do that. This is how you would use the timer. You just initiate a timer. Now it's quote unquote started there. It recorded the time that it was instantiated because the constructor called the start function. But if you did want to start it later, you can call the start function manually. And that all that does is record, here's the microsecond since 1970 that, that we started, okay? Um, here is some function that takes some time, and then we record the amount of time that has elapsed, and then we print that out. Make sure that what you do not do like, there's a reason I set up this elapsed variable here, because if you had said standard C out elapsed time is, and then T dot elapsed right here, what happens is you're also timing, like before it gets to there, it's printing out this part. And so you're timing that printing as well. So make sure that you set up an elapsed time immediately, record it, and then later print it out. Someone said, what's the advantage of making our own timer class instead of using SF clock? Seems to be the base functionality. SF clock's resolution is not as high as standard chrono um, high resolution clock now. 
okay? It's, it's just not as high as that. And not only that, but if we want to say, use our profiler that we're about to write, or we want to use this timer in a program that doesn't include SFML, we certainly don't want to in have to include this huge graphics library, SFML, just to use a timer, right? So you can use this timer for any code. This, just, this isn't just for video games or for SFML programs. This can be used in any C++ project. And so we're doing it all from scratch because A, it's fun, um, for me at least, and B, you know, now you have a timer that can be used anywhere, not just within SFML. Okay. Now we're going to get into visual profiling and I want to give credit where credit is due. The following slides and the following code were inspired by a YouTube video by the Cherno and his video is visual benchmarking in C++. There is the link. And if you go to that, you're going to see a lot of this stuff on those slides or in his video. Uh, however, um, when he released that video, I noticed a few things that he did, not necessarily incorrectly, but inefficiently. There were some functionalities that I wanted, and so I actually was on the GitHub discussion with him. You can look at that discussion here, um, where I made a bunch of updates to the thing that he presented. So the Cherno made this video. I was like blown away by it. I thought it was really cool. I looked into the code. I found a bunch of things that I thought that I could improve for my own purposes. And this is what I'm presenting is like the updated improved version, but definitely like got to give credit to the Cherno for his, uh, for his video on that. So visual code profiling, we just talked about like numerical code pro profiling. What do I mean by visual profiling? Humans are visual creatures. Staring at text output is difficult to understand. It just is. If you say it's not, trust me, it is. If you can have data presented in text form and data presented in a meaningful visual form, you can far more quickly and more easily process visual data than you can text data. So what if we want to visually profile our code? What if we could get something like this? So before we just had, um, oh yeah. So someone said starting staring. Thank you. Typo. All right, what if we could get something like this? Rather than just looking at this like hierarchy call tree in text, what if we could say, oh, here's my onframe function and inside the onframe function, like, look, I'm doing uh, user input and collisions and then all sorts of, and then the render function and the render function is broken down into these functions. And it's like, you can see at a glance and zoom in and zoom out. And it's just, it's amazing. So let's make that. Let's make that now in this class. So it turns out Chrome has a built-in tool for visualizing JSON data that is related to, to this sort of tracing. Um, initially, it was meant for website profiling, but if we output our data in the same format that Chrome tracing expects, it can visualize our stuff for us. So if we can output our timing code in that format, we can see it in Chrome. Now the full format is here. I've included a link in the slides, but essentially it looks kind of like this. Um, each trace result. So our output is going to be a JSON file and the JSON file is going to have a bunch of objects and those objects are going to have a bunch of different properties. Now, not every property is required, but it'll have something like a name. So that'll be the event name. Uh, it could, you can have categories. Um, you can have an event type. You can have uh, the time starting for the timestamp, um, the process ID, the thread ID, uh, the ending time, all sorts of different data can be visualized. So what we have to do is we have to come up with a system that outputs our profiling data in this format, okay? So for example, here is a sample tracing file. Um, our trace events, that is going to be the main array of things, um, is going to have two events inside, inside this. So let's say um, we outputted this data. The first um, event, this is going to be a function. So this is a function call. The duration is approximately two seconds or two million microseconds. The name is function one, and then um, some other data down here that we may or may not end up using, okay? Um, 
Down here, we have another function. This is called function two. It lasted for a second. And I think uh, these are like the timestamps of when it started versus when it finished. And what we get from that is we get an output that looks like this. So we had function one, which started as soon as our program ran at zero seconds. It ran for two seconds and then it stopped. And then function two ran for another second. And how much easier is it to, to look at this than it is to look at this, right? Not only that, but it's a smart visualizer. So if a function starts before another function ends, it means that that function must have been called by the previous function, right? And so we can have functions nested within functions. So here, for example, we called function two, but one second into function two, we called function three. And so function three is going for the last second of that, right? So let's look at a quick demo of how this works. So here is Chrome tracing and you literally just open Chrome and type in Chrome uh, colon slash slash tracing. Okay. So you just click on that and this UI opens up. Okay. So let's drag in that sample result that we had. And so this is literally the JSON file um, that we just showed. And so you can look around, uh, you can zoom in, oops, uh, you can zoom in here. You can zoom out and you can see, all right, um, this is function one, this is function two. This isn't super interesting, right? It's just two functions. Let's pull in a result from another program. And this is from a game engine that I wrote, um, which is based on um, the engine that we wrote for this class. So it's, it's this engine, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? So let's have a look. Oh, well, you can tell immediately that uh, there's this big initialization function that runs at the start of the program. And that initialization function takes uh, 1.3 seconds. So let's see what's happened in that initialization function. Well, our assets load from file function is being called, right? So let's drill down into that assets load from file. Oh, look, here's all of our different texture loading. So this texture, whatever this one happened to be, it took um, 1.9 milliseconds to load that texture. It took 1.3 milliseconds to load this texture. So we can see all of the different textures being loaded here. Then something happened after the textures were loaded. What is this? Oh, wow, these things didn't take very long at all. Ah, this is the adding of the animations, right? So here's the adding of the animations. These took like 0 0.001 milliseconds. Really easy to add those animations. Next, we added this font and it took nine milliseconds to add that font. Oh, wow. Okay. So fonts take a long time to load. Um, and then we keep going. So look, we loaded in three different fonts, whatever they were. And then we added in some, some sounds. Holy crap. Look at how long it takes in SFML to load those sounds, right? So immediately you get all of this crazy information that you can visualize and you can just immediately see, okay, loading all of my assets took, um, let's see here, looks like 500 milliseconds. So it took us half a second to load all that stuff uh, when we started the game. Uh, then something else happened. Then we called uh, gameplay init. Oh, look, there's where I initialized my memory pool. And it took me about half a second to initialize my memory pool. Now, if I look over here, you can see all the different game frames. Right? So here's my game engines on frame function. So each of these, if we look down, should be approximately 16 milliseconds, right? So there's 17 milliseconds. This one took 16.6 milliseconds. So we can see exactly what happened on each frame of our game. So let's drill down into this particular, oh, this one over here looks actually kind of interesting uh, because it's, it's just bigger than this one. So here's my game state play on frame. Okay, so my game state play took this much of an entire frame. Now it turns out that this over here where it's not doing anything, this is where um, SFML had that weight in there just so we don't go over 60, um, 60 frames per second. So this blank space is where SFML is just waiting. And we can see, wow, we're only taking up like a quarter of the time that we're allotted to stay within 60 milliseconds per, or 16 milliseconds per frame. So let's look at what actually happens within a frame. Okay, let's drill down. 
Um, well, the first thing we do is the movement system. The movement system took like one or 0.2 milliseconds, not very long at all. I have this mouse over system. What is this one? This is the lifespan system. Lifespan doesn't take very long to calculate at all. Oh, look, then I have my collision system, right? So in this game engine, I had circle line collisions. They took a while. Um, then over here, I have uh, circle physics collisions. That, that took a while. Um, yeah, so my circle physics collisions look like it took the longest of all. And down here is where I have this like detect collisions function. So you can really drill down and, and see what is exactly happening. Here is my, um, my update effects, my user input. Oh, that took a while. Maybe that shouldn't take that long. And then my rendering system. Here's where I drew the grid. Here's where I drew the entities. Here's where I drew the walls. And uh, here's where I set the text. And then down here, what's this? This is where I actually drew the text. So on each frame of the game, I can see exactly what's happening, right? And I can see, oh, some frames took way shorter than other frames. That only took one millisecond. Um, and in here, like, oh, look, this one took a while so I could drill down and see what's happening there. All right. So that is Chrome tracing. And it turns out that there's actually a new user interface. So when you load Chrome tracing, it says, try the new Perfetto UI. So Perfetto UI, you can open a trace file. So let's open the same trace file in the Perfetto UI. And it's just, it just has a different interface. So I can go to process zero and I can look at this in the exact same way that I just looked at the other ones. Okay, so it, it holds all the same data. It's just a different, um, a different user interface. It's a little bit smoother. It lets me zoom in a little bit more, etc. So that UI is, it doesn't have any extra functionality as far as I know. Um, it's just, um, it just looks different. Someone says, is this CXX trace? No, this is actually, we are, you just tuned in at the right time because we are writing our own instrumentation profiler. And I'm just showing how once you get the JSON output, you can load that JSON output into Chrome tracing as a visualizer. Okay. So let's go on with the lecture and see how we will implement this for ourselves. So uh, here we go. All right, so that was the demo of Chrome tracing. Now let's talk about our actual profile. Like how are we going to write this instrumentation code? How do we transition from the timer class that we just wrote? So I know a few people just showed up. We just wrote um, all the timer class, uh, the timer class, which says how long something took to run. And now how do we go from that timer class to actually outputting that JSON file in order to visualize it? Right. Someone just said, I thought this other program has all the tracing needs you'll ever need. Yeah, but it's not, you don't understand it until you've implemented it yourself. Right. This is a university course. We want to know how things work and implement things ourselves. Um, I mean, we could have just used Unity to write our game. Right. But we're writing our own game engine. So this is all about understanding and implementation. And then later on, when you go to work for a company, they'll have a profiler that they spent a million dollars on and you'll use that one, of course. You're not gonna use the one we wrote in this course forever. Okay, back to my point. The timer class cannot, cannot output to the file itself because all the data needs to go to a single file, right? We gotta make sure that we're outputting all of this data to the JSON file, to the same JSON file. If only we had a way to globally write to a single file somehow, right? So singleton to the rescue. We need to write out to a single profiling file. And we saw at the very, at the very beginning of this lecture, how a singleton can help us do that. Um, is a profiler singleton that manages timers an okay thing to do? Someone just asked. Great question. You just, the, big spoiler alert. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so here is our initial start, initial implementation of a profiler class. So we've got a class here. We're going to have some public things and we're going to have this implemented as a singleton class. All right, so we're going to have that same output file stream and this is going to be our results.json file. 
So the profiler is going to be constructed at some point when it's first called, and it's going to keep this file output stream open, and we're going to be pumping JSON out to that file, okay? Then we're going to have the profiler, which is um, the profiler constructor, which because it's a singleton, it's private. So the profile, the blah. The profiler is a singleton, so its constructor is private. Inside the profiler's constructor, we're going to write the JSON header. What do I mean by the JSON header? Well, here's the JSON file, right? So we've got to have this like initial curly brace, this other data, which is blank, trace events, colon. And so that's the header. And then later on, we're going to need this footer as well. And then every time we time something, so we're going to write the header, then we're going to write all the timing events. And then when we destruct and we, we stop the program, we're going to write the footer for this. Okay. So the profiler is the, the constructor is going to write the header. Then this is a singleton class. So we have our instance. This is our pattern for implementing a singleton class. And then we are going to have a function, which is to write profile. Okay. So this is going to take in a profile result. And I'll show what a profile result is. Essentially, a profile result is like the name of the thing that we profiled, the starting time and the ending time. And then when you call this, it will write out to the JSON file in the particular format. Then the destructor of the profiler will be called, because it's a singleton, the destructor will be called only when the program terminates. So when the program terminates, you're going to write the JSON footer to the file, and then your output will be done. So the main idea here is that when the timer stops, you're going to want to call profiler instance dot write profile. Okay. So whenever we take, we take that timer beforehand and whenever the timer stops, we want to write that out to this profiler singleton. And that profile result looks something like this. We're going to have a profile result as a struct. It's going to have a name. That name is just going to be whatever, like my function or loop iteration or whatever. It's going to have a starting time, an ending time, and a thread ID, because we could use this in a multi-threaded way if we wanted to. Okie doke. So what we had in our timer function before was whenever we call the elapsed function, we wanted to be able to print that out to the screen, right? How much time has elapsed? But our profile timer is going to be a little bit different. So the timer just said, okay, calculate the start time, calculate the end time, and return end minus start. Our profile timer is going to be different because we're not going to be wanting to manually call this elapsed function. We want instead to have a stop function, right? We're going to start the timer and we're going to stop the timer. And so we're going to calculate this result so we're going to say the result is uh, result.start. We're going to calculate the start time the same way we did before. And then we're going to store result.end. We're going to calculate the end time. And instead of returning that, we're going to call the profiler instance and write that result out to our JSON file. Okay. So the stop function within our timer is going to call the profiler's in instance and then write the result for us. So essentially, at some point, we're going to start a timer. At some point, we're going to stop a timer, and we know that calling stop is going to output that to the file for us, so we don't need to worry about that, okay? So this is all that good stuff about data encapsulation and RAII, all that's being done for us. So here's an example usage of how we would use our profile timer. So we set up our profile timer, and we give it a name, right? Because we want the name to be visually displayed out in our Chrome tracing. So we're going to call main, so this will just be called main, right? We'll do some other things. Then maybe we'll start the timer, right? So this starts the profile timer. We have a function that takes some amount of time and then we call stop. And the stop is going to um, calculate the amount of time relapsed that was elapsed. And then the profiler is going to log it. Because remember the stop function calls write result to the file. So here our profile timer, when we construct it, it writes the header of the JSON file. Then uh, we're going to call stop and that will, um, the profiler will log it. And, and then when the program terminates, the singleton is going to be destructed and the footer of the JSON file is going to be written. Perfect. So we have a profile timer that works. We are outputting JSON in the correct format 
we could just use this if we wanted to. This would just work, right? But we want it to be a little bit more convenient than that, right? We don't want to have to be calling a constructor with a name and then dot start and then dot stop and all this other nonsense. So let's see how we can make this more convenient. If we want to profile a lot of areas of code, manually starting and stopping the timer each time will be annoying. And not only will it be annoying, but it will mess up your code as well, right? It'll just be everywhere, all this timing code. So let's develop a way to time a block of code by simply typing one command, okay? And any block of code that has that command will automatically be profiled to the JSON. So here's what we want to happen. We want to be able to say something like profile timer T with my func, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make the profile timer stop and log when its destructor is called, right? So someone out there in the chat said, if constructor is start and destructor is end. Exactly. So when we call the constructor, the timer starts. Remember that we already have, we call start inside the constructor. And then some code runs here where it's going to take a while. And then when we, in our destructor now for the profile timer, we're going to call that stop function. And whenever we call the stop function, it's going to log it to a file for us. So look, we have one line of code that now is going to be able to profile this function for us. And not only that, but it works inside blocks of code as well, not just inside these inside functions. So I could have a profile timer inside a loop iteration. The timer is going to start. We do some stuff in the loop and then outside here, the timer is going to destruct and the profile timer is going to log it. You don't have to wait for the end of a function. You just have to wait for the end of a block of code so that your timer will be destructed and it will log for you. So here's what our profile timer is going to look like now. All right. So we have um, our profile timer result, right? Our, our profile result M result. So that's where the start and the end and the name and stuff are going to be recorded. We're going to record whether or not our, our timer has already stopped. And we have to have this starting uh, time point um, from standard chrono. So this is these are the variables inside our profile timer. Then inside our profile timer, the constructor of the profile timer is going to take in a name right? So that's going to be the name of whatever we happen to be profiling, whether that's my function or my iteration or whatever. So we're going to set the name of the result equal to that name. And we're going to set the starting point of, of the timer. So this is the timer's start, essentially. Now, down here in the destructor of the profile timer, we're going to call the stop function. So whenever the profile timer goes out of scope, it's destructed and we call stop and we log that to a file. So here's the stop functionality for our timer. So again, chrono gets a little bit verbose. So we're using namespace chrono and you can do this by the way, you can use namespace chrono inside of a block of code and that using namespace will only be active for that block of code. All right. So when we call stop, we're going to check to see if we've already stopped, right? If we've already stopped, don't do anything. But if we have stopped, or if we haven't stopped, set stopped equal to true. Then we're going to do the actual timing part where we calculate how much time has elapsed. And we're going to say the end time point is equal to high resolution clock now. I'm going to set my starting time. So I'm going to do my time cast to microseconds of the starting timer. I'm going to set my end time, which is a time cast to microseconds of the end timer. Then I'm going to set my thread ID. So automatically, this is a multi-threaded profile timer. And so you can, you can get the thread ID from within C++ by using standard thread. And then I'm going to call the profiler instance and write the profile of the internal result that I have stored. There you go. So that's what happens now. So my profile timer will take in a name. It will start it on constructor. It will profile whatever code goes in here. And then on a destructor call, it will, um, it will log out to the file. All right. Now, this is still a little bit inconvenient, even though it's just one line of code. It's too much stuff. Look at this. Profile timer T my func. Profile. Okay. Th th that's too much code. Let's go even further with the convenience. 
This is still a little bit annoying. We don't want to have to manually name our timers for every function that we call on it, right? Functions names might change. And then we have to go and edit the timer names. Oh my God, what a nightmare that would be. Also, what if we want to turn profiling on or off, right? We certainly want profiling when we're developing the program, but when we ship the game to the consumer, we don't want any profiling to be on, generating these gigabytes and gigabytes of JSON files, right? We want to, we want, we want to be able to turn it on and off. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a macro. And that macro is going to do all of this for us automatically. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define a macro called profiling, right? Now in practice, you may want something that's a little bit more verbose than just profiling because if someone uses um, profiling somewhere, you know, it'll replace it with a one. So, so make sure this is like, you know, my underscore profile or underscore whatever. So we're going to define profiling. That is a macro definition. So the C++ preprocessor knows that profiling is now defined. Okay. Then we're going to say, okay, if def profiling, it means that if we have defined profiling, let's do some profiling. Okay. And the, the thing here is that we're creating a macro to do the profiling for us, but we're going to say at the end, if we don't have profiling enabled, then our, our profiling macro will do absolutely nothing. Okay. So let's make two macros. If profiling is enabled, we're going to make two macros. One is profile scope and one is profile function. Okay. So profile scope is going to take in a name. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to create a profile timer and that timer has to have a variable name, right? And that variable name can't just be the same thing. Why is that? Because if we have a profile timer that's initialized right after another profile timer, we'll have name conflicts. So there's a really cool thing in the C++ preprocessor. These are called preprocessor directives. So what I do here is I call underscore, underscore line, underscore, underscore. And what that does is it takes the current line of code that I'm on and it inserts it into the variable name for this timer. So this will be like timer 106, timer 429, right? So that means every line of code that I have a timer on will have a unique variable name. So that's what this line of code does. And it sets it up with that name. So that means I no longer have to type a variable name. All I have to do if I want to profile a scope of code is type in a name for that. Okay. Next, the other thing is to profile a function. So I'm going to be profiling a lot of functions and I don't want to have to type in function names. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call profile function. And then luckily C++, the, pro the preprocessor, there's another preprocessor directive and that is underscore underscore function. So what that will do is whenever I call this function, it will call my profile scope macro with the function name that I'm currently in, which is inserted automatically. And so it will do this for me. Okay. So I've got this function now. And whenever I want to profile a function, I just, that's it. That's all I have to call. So I don't have to put in any names, any variables, any, anything. And not only that, but if profiling is not defined, then I'm going to say else define profile scope name as nothing. So essentially what happens is wherever I go to profile code, if I have profiling enabled, it will actually construct the timers and do the profiling. But if I don't have it enabled, then it's turned off. And wherever I have these function calls, it will literally eliminate that code from my code because the macro means nothing anymore. So if I ever want to profile, like if I ever want to compile my code and ship the release build to a bunch of customers, I just undefine profiling and now nothing happens. So I can turn on or off profiling just by recompiling my code. All right. So we define a macro called profiling. I didn't realize I had all these slides. I, I looked at it all. I looked at it and explained it there. 
So if profiling is defined, then the profile mac macro is defined normally, causing the program to output the log to the JSON file. If it's not defined, then the macro is left blank by the presoft processor, turning off profiling with zero overhead. So here is now how I would use the profile timer macros. If I want to profile a function, all I have to do is call profile function. And the C++ will look at the macro that I've defined for profile function and replace that by saying profile timer, timer, and then it will pass in my func as the name of the timer for me. So that's all I have to do is type that. Now, I still have to, if I want to profile a scope, I do have to type in an actual name for the scope, okay? And the reason for that, the reason I don't just take the function name is what if I wanted to profile a bunch of different loops inside the same function, right? So whenever we profile a scope of code or a block of code, not a whole function, we do have to give that a name somehow, okay? So let's look at what this looks like in practice. So if I have a function, and I say profile function. So I call profile function, then I'm going to sleep for one second. So it's not gonna do anything for one second, or it's just gonna be busy looping for one second. Then I'm going to have a for loop, and it's going to run 10 times, and I'm gonna profile scope of loop iteration, and that profile scope loop iteration, then inside this function, or inside this for loop, that's gonna happen 10 times, I'm going to sleep, for 100 milliseconds, okay? So if I sleep for one second, and then I sleep for 100 milliseconds 10 times, my total running time should be two seconds. So if I look down here, I have my my function. My function was profiled, right? So it took two full seconds to do my function, but inside of my function, it did 10 of these loop iterations, and each of those were 100 milliseconds long. And if you look, that's 10 times 100 milliseconds, which is a second. All right? Now, at the very end here, you do see that this might go just past two seconds, and that's just a little bit of overhead of actually, at the end, having to write this thing to a file and clear the buffer. Okay? So that's how we use it. It's literally that easy. So what I'm going to do now, uh, I've put the code... On the, in the code folder for the profile timer on the course website. So you can go look at that if you want to. And let's open our assignment number three again. So before we looked at assignment number three and we used Visual Studio's profiler, right? Now let's use our profiler, okay? So we can see here that we have all of that code. Here is our profile result. And so I've gotten all of this code into my profiler.hpp. So here's my macro that I can use. I can turn on or off profiling. And actually Visual Studio is pretty cool because I can do this, right? And then I think the syntax highlighting, yeah. So it'll, now all of this is gray because it's no longer active, right? If I redefine that, then this will switch back to active. So now my, pro, my, my macros are active. So those are some macros um, that, I, that I had for profiling. Now here's my profile result. It has the name, the start, and the end. Here's my profiler singleton. And you can see it does everything that we did. Here's the writing of the header and the writing of the footer. So in the profiler constructor, I set up the output stream. I write the header out to the output stream. Um, my instance, that's my singleton pattern. In my destructor, I write the footer out to the file, and I have my write profile function inside my um, my singleton profiler class. Now, I didn't have this code in the slides because it would have taken up too much time, but essentially here, you can just see me constructing the JSON file format, right? So it takes the result, and it prints out, okay, the category is function, the duration is end minus start, uh, the thread ID is TID, and the time start was result.start, and some other nonsense that I have to put in here. And also, I've put in a lock guard, so I've put in a mutex so that this system can be used in a multi-threaded system, okay? So the mutex here is just to make sure that we're not writing two profiles at once if you're using this in a multi-threaded system. Okay, so that is the actual profiler, that's the singleton profiler. And down here is the profile timer that we had.
right? So I've just done a type def of this huge long standard chrono thing into clock type um, just to make it easier to read. So my profile timer has the clock type, that's the start time point. It has the profile result and whether or not it's start, uh, it's it's stopped. You can see here in the uh, constructor, I set up a new result and I call start on that result. Um, and in the destructor, I call stop. In start, what I do is I just create the start time endpoint. And this also has a little note in here. So let me go back to Chrome tracing just for a little bit. Sometimes if you write this in its purest form, there's a little display bug here where if, if the resolution of your clock is low enough such that one event starts on the same microsecond that the next event, sorry, something ends on the same time that the next thing begins, the visualization can get kind of screwed up, okay? So what I have built in here is it just says if the previous thing started on the same frame that this is beginning, add one microsecond to this. So it's not the same value so that my visualization doesn't get screwed up. So that's that's a janky fix and it shouldn't need to be like that, but it is. So I put in that little janky fix and then the stop function does um, exactly what I did in the slides, which is to, to stop things and then output the profile. There you go. All right, so how do we use this? How do we use this thing? Well, let's do some profiling. This is my solution code for assignment three. So hopefully I'm not um, giving too much stuff away. Let's go over first to our main function. And what we're going to do is we're going to say profile function. There we go. That's all I need to do for every function that I want to be profiled is put profile function at the top of the function. Uh, so let's go over here and we're going to go to um, our game engine. Okay, so we go to the game engine. Maybe we want to profile the init of the game engine. Um, let's go over to our asset loading. So this is our loading from file, right? So this is load from file. That's all our different assets. Um, I want to profile my adding of textures. I want to profile my adding of animations. I want to profile my adding of fonts. And that's it. I just, I want to profile all of my asset stuff. Let's go back to the game engine class. I'll move it over here. Um, I don't necessarily, this is just th these simple functions that are just like return some values. I don't need to profile those. Those are pretty much instantaneous. Let's profile the run of my game engine. Um, and so now I have an update function. Oh, let's profile my user input. I, I want to profile user input. That's a good thing. Um, my update function, here we go. So I'm going to uh, profile my update function. That's something that I would want to do. And also what I want to do is I'm going to want, I want to profile this window.display because the window.display function from SFML is the thing that does the waiting for the next time step, right? So it, Let's say that we have 16 milliseconds per frame. If our game is only taking up like, I don't know, two milliseconds for the calculation, it's going to be doing nothing for 14 milliseconds. And I want to be sure that that's the case, right? So how could I profile just this single line of code given the profile function and profile scope things that I've done? Well, it turns out that you can create your own blocks of code in C++ wherever you want. So if I wanted to, if I want to profile this single line of code, I'm going to create a code block that has its own scope. And I'm going to say profile scope. And this is going to be called um, SFML display. Perfect. Done. So what happens here is that we start the timer right here. It does the display the block of code finishes and that variable is destructed. So if I want to profile a single line or just a few lines of code, I can do that with this sort of syntax, okay? And again, if I turn off profiling, this block of code does nothing. It doesn't, it doesn't impact my, my, um, my function at all. So those are the things inside my game engine that I want to uh, 
I want to program, I want to profile. Let's now go into my scene menu. Okay, so let's profile uh, the initialization of my menu scene. Let's profile the do action of my menu scene, and let's profile the rendering of my menu scene. Okay, that's fine. That's all I want to do in there. Now the actual playing of the game, right? The Mario game engine. That's where I want to do a lot of my profiling. So let's profile um, the initialization function. Um, let's see here. Let's profiling the loading of the level. That'd be cool to see how long that takes. Spawning of the player. Um, our, up, our update function here. That would be something we want to do. Um, spawning of bullets. Sure, why not? Let's profile that. Here's my movement system. Um, here is my lifespan system my collision system, my do action system, do, 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 my animation system. So I'm just going in here and I'm manually putting this instrumentation in, right? Here's my rendering system. Okay, so that's pretty much, I think all I would want to actually profile. And that's it. All I've done is I've put that little bit of code into my code. So let's run the game now. We'll run the game for a few frames. Uh, hopefully it compiles because I'm doing this live. Okay. So I'm looking around. Here I am destroying some stuff, shooting some bullets. Here we go. I'm going to play a few frames. Maybe I'll jump up here. Okay. I'll go back to the menu. Then I'll exit. There we go. Now, if all worked correctly, then over in my... Um, I closed the folders. Give me a second. Yeah, so I have a results.json file now that I can pull over here into Chrome Tracing. Look at this already. So this is my profile of assignment three. Now, let me go into main. Okie doke. Well, the game engine init function took, how long did it take to init? Uh, 385 milliseconds. Wow, that's actually a long time. I didn't think it would take that long. But... Here is where a lot of that time was taken. Here's my assets being loaded from the file. So here's me loading all of my textures for assignment three. This isn't some like, you know, million dollar program that we had to buy a license for. We just did this from scratch in a half an hour, right? It's really cool. So, oh, you can see here that most of the asset loading time, like here's the total duration for the asset loading. Actually, let me, uh, let me go over to this because I think I can zoom in more in the uh, Perfetto tracing. I'm not as familiar with the syntax for this, so give me a break if I don't. Um, yeah, okay. So this, I think I can zoom in just a little bit more. Let me zoom. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, whatever. Get out of here. So in here, ah, give me a sec. All right. So here's my game engine init function. I can zoom into this and see all my asset loading. My asset loading, uh, here's my textures. Over here, I can see my animations. These are add animation here. I'm gonna go back to Chrome tracing. I'm sorry if this is a little bit small, but that's all I can do. I'm not very good at the other user interface. So here were all of my um, texture loading. Here you can see these little tiny slivers those are the adding of my animations. So my animation loading didn't take much time at all, but my font loading, look at how long it takes to load a font. That's kind of crazy, that's pretty big, right? But now I say, why is there so much time in my game engine init function that wasn't profiled? What is all this stuff? What did I miss? So let me go back to my code. Here we go. So over in my game engine, here's my init function. Oh, I see. Now, I did the profiling of my assets, but what I can do here is let's profile the scope of creating the SFML window, right? So profile, scope, and this is going to be called uh, create SFML window. Perfect. All right. So I assume that that is where all that missing time is. This is creating the SFML window. I'm going to add some more stuff, okay? Um, 
and I'm going to run it again later and we'll see later if that's what was what was missing. All right. Now, over here in my game engine's run function, I have my game engine update. So my game engine update, let me look over here at a sample one. Oh, look at this. Yeah. So here's my game engine update function. And look at how much time. So game engine update took 16 milliseconds. So this thing is running um, at 60 frames per second. And you can see that 15 of those 16 milliseconds are SFML waiting to display the next frame. Okay, but let's look at what wasn't that. Oh, wow, look at this. My game engine user input is taking over a millisecond. It's taking a long ass time. What the hell is that? Um, that's, that's not what I expected. My do action isn't taking that much time. So why is that taking so much time? My user input, here I have um, scene menu render and I can't see. All right. Oh yeah. So over here at the beginning, this is where I was playing. Oops. Ah, sorry. At the very beginning. If I can get back to the very beginning, this is where I was on the menu. Okay. So I've got some user input stuff going on. I've got the menu scenes render functionality and just the rest of it is waiting. Okay. So the rest of it is waiting because essentially the menu rendering didn't take very long. So at some point we left the menu and we go into the actual gameplay. So let me go out here somewhere where we're actually doing something in the gameplay. And now here in our game state update, we can actually see other things going on. All right. Now we have game engine user input. That's still taking a lot of time. And I'm going to, I'm going to drill down into that later and see what's taking so much time in my user input function. Uh, my scene play update. Well, here is my movement function. My movement function is taking 0.01 of a millisecond. So that's really fast. Uh, my lifespan is taking almost no time at all. My collision system is the majority of my update function, but that's, that's to be expected. Right. And over here I have the animation system. Now I have the rendering functionality or here, here's the render timing for my gameplay update. And then this is like the actual drawing of the scene. And then over here I have the waiting to draw the next scene. So look at, look at how much difference there is. This is how it's 0.2 milliseconds of actually rendering the Mario scene and then 15 milliseconds of doing absolutely nothing. But I have a couple of questions here. One of my questions is what's going on in my user input? Why is that so slow? Okay. Like it should take way longer to do my collisions than my user input. Right? So I don't know. Like I, I actually literally do not know why my user input is so slow. So live right now, we're going to figure out why my user input is so slow. Not only that, um, I want to know how is my rendering broken down? Okay. So what is taking all of this time in the rendering? I want to know that. So let's go back here and we'll go back first to the game engine and this user input functionality that is taking a lot of time and I don't know why. So let's put in um, some stuff here, shall we? So I'm pretty sure it's probably this window.poll event, right? That's probably happening. So let's go and we'll go profile scope. This is a poll event loop, okay? Now down here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to profile scope um, on my key pressed or key released key event. And down here, I'm going to have my uh, mouse press event. And down here, I'm going to have mouse release. And down here is the mouse move. Mouse move. So I've profiled all the scopes of all the different things I could think of inside my user input function. So now I'll see a breakdown 
of that when I actually go to, um, to my profiler or my visual profiler. And the second thing I wanted to do is inside my play functionality, I wanted to see all the different things inside my uh, rendering system. So let's, let's look at the rendering system. Here, um, this block of code, I'm gonna make a block of code around this so I can profile it. And this is gonna be profile scope. This is gonna be um, camera view. So that's where I change the camera view. Here is where I draw the textures. So draw textures. Here is, um, this is me drawing collisions. And down here, this is me um, drawing the grid. And then that's it. That's it. All right. So now that I have all of those things put in there, I'm going to uh, rerun my program and we'll do one last debugging profile and we'll see. Okay. So here I am playing the game. Do, 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 do. We'll play it for a few hundred frames. So I'm going to shoot some bullets. I'm going to do this stuff. Oh, I want to put one more thing in here, actually. Uh, in my entity manager. Let's profile my entity manager. So this is profile function. Because my entity manager update, right, that does some stuff. So I want to see how long my entity manager update function is taking. That's the last thing I wanted to do. Uh why don't we also do some physics? So let's say, now here's the thing, profile function. Did I do that in my entity manager? I did. So I'm gonna profile the get overlap function. The problem with the get overlap function, here's the trade-off you need to make with your profiling. This get overlap function is going to be called tens of thousands of times. And this may end up slowing down my program a little bit because it's called so often. So maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe what I want to do is I want to go back to my scene play and put scopes inside my collision detection system so that I can actually see what's taking up all the time. Let's do that. So here we're going to put a scope and this is going to be profile scope oops, profile scope, and this is going to be player bullet collisions. Okay, so that's gonna be here. Let me copy and paste this. Down here, this is where I do uh, tile collisions. So this is gonna be tile collisions. All right, so I put a scope in there and that's pretty much all there is. Um, yeah, that's that's collisions with tiles. Perfect. All right, so now let's run it and we'll see what type of data we get, which will be pretty cool. So here we go, we're playing the game. Play the game once more, collect some data. Do, 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 do. All right, I did a whole bunch of stuff and now I exit the game. Okay, so now over here, I have my new results.json file and I'm gonna pull it over into Chrome. So here's my game engine run. Alrighty, aha. So that scope of code where I did this back in the game engine, remember how I put this scope of code around creating the SFML window? That is what, ooh, geez, wrong window. That is what took up all that time. Okay, so now I can know, okay, well, that's the creating of the SFML window. I really have no control over that, okay? So I've profiled that that's pretty much as, that, that's pretty optimal in terms of like my initialization. I really can't make that any faster because all I'm doing is loading the assets from file and then creating this window. Now let me go into one of the frames of the game and I'll see what data I have here. Alrighty, so, Inside one scene play update function, uh, here's my entity manager update. Look at that, it doesn't take very long at all, right? It's like 
a third or a three thousandths of a millisecond to do the entity manager update. So my entity manager update code is pretty quick on average. Then I have my movement function. So my movement function takes a little bit of time, not as little as lifespan. Oh, look at here. So here is my um, collision function. And remember, I broke down my collision function into two things. Look, my tile collisions are by far most of the time in the collision. So I know that most of my collision time is detecting entity tile collisions. But over here, look at this. What is this? This little thing. I can't even click it. It's so little. But that's my bullet time collision. Yeah, so player bullet collision. That uh, that was the that that's not taking very much time at all, and in fact, it'll probably take zero time if I actually have no bullets. So that that wasn't a, a great test there. Um, the last thing I wanted to show was how my rendering is actually broken down. So here uh, we have my rendering system, and the rendering was broken down into changing my camera view, and changing my camera view is not taking very much time at all, and then the drawing of my textures. Okay, so the drawing of the textures obviously is the thing that takes most of the time um, for rendering the whole scene. And then the rest of the scene is just waiting to display the next thing. So if you ever came across like a frame of your game, which took up a lot of time, you could see that here by one of these SFML things not being quite so large, right? So let's see if I can pinpoint any lag frames here. Oh, what's this? What's this? Okay, here's an, an anomalous frame. So this is good. So I can come all the way down in here now and look at this. So on this frame, my user input function took up like 14 milliseconds. What the hell was that? So if I look in here, here's a poll event loop. Here's another poll event loop. Oh, so this is where I was moving the mouse around a little bit. But look, the vast majority of the time is stuck. Like it's nothing is being profiled here. So this may tell me that maybe SFML's polling when there's a bunch of events is not very optimal um, because my poll event loops, even with mouse events, aren't taking that much time. So that's kind of crazy that like I spent almost an entire frame in this user input. So you would want to go in there and you would want to actually um, see what's going on, debug it more and try and eliminate this slowdown because that, that almost made our game lag just within the user input function. All right, so that is it for the lecture. I know I went a little bit long. Um, the great thing is this lecture is not necessary for your project, right? This was just sort of, um, bonus stuff for if you actually give a damn about being a good programmer and being a good game programmer. Um, that is how you can profile your code. Someone else um, out there said, I wonder if C++ or C Sharp can do this in a similarly elegant fashion. Well, all you would have to do in C Sharp would be to take my profiler class, which I wrote here. This is the entirety of the code for the profiler class. And you would write that in C Sharp. That's it. And you can do it. Um, and you'd have your profiler and you drag it over into Chrome and it can visualize it for you. All right, so that is it for the lecture. Thank you very much. Um, sorry that one went a little bit long and we'll see you in the next one uh, for an introduction to shaders and you can use shaders with SFML, which is really great. And you will need to use some shaders on your final project. So make sure to tune into that one. All right, see ya.